Welcome to another episode of law.mit.edu's Idea Flow. And today, March 25th, 2022, we have a really core topic for you and one that is near and dear to our hearts and to our research, namely the law surrounding decentralized autonomous organizations. And in particular, um, we have with us some very esteemed guests from um, who, who are the co-authors of the DAO model law. And so what we're doing today is a little bit of a different format in that we're going to get a summary of this model law. And the purpose of the gathering today is really to discuss, ask questions, and most especially provide feedback to the authors um, that they can take on board as they look at potentially making further amendments or modifications and um, and and uh, and future adaptation of the model law. So, um, you know, new models of blockchain based organizations are that are referred to as DAOs, they face significant legal uncertainty, and that can be detrimental to their development and to their utilization. And so this model law um, aims to create uniformity and legal certainty while unlike other regulatory frameworks for DAOs, still accommodate flexibility for further innovation by not imposing formal registration requirements. Um, so to, um, to get a copy of, of uh, more background and a link directly to the model law, you can go to our episode page at law.mit.edu forward slash pub forward slash idea flow 12. That's um, one word, idea flow, number one, number two, or just numeral 12. Um, but so with that now, I'd like to introduce uh, or basically invite our guests to introduce themselves. Um, and we have three guests with us today um, who are co-authors. Um, firstly, uh, we have, uh, hold on one moment. Ah, okay, I wanna make sure I've got the, the right affiliations. Uh, we have, Primavera Del Filippi, who um, is director uh, for research at SIRSA and also a faculty associate at Berkman Klein Center, and I think very notably a co founder of Koala, which is the organization uh, behind this model law. We also have Constance Choi, co founder and director of Koala Foundation and an associate researcher at, at um, SIRSA. And finally, uh, we have uh, with us, um, Silke, um, and then you'll have to help me with pronouncing your last name, El. El, El Rufai. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. Who's general counsel of and um, chief legal officer of Gnosis, uh, which is a very big deal uh, in the DAO space, and also very active in in Koala. Among many, each of these people have many other accolades as well. And so, what I'd like to do at this point is actually pass the baton to our esteemed guests. And, and invite you to do any further introductions of yourself that would be helpful for context. And then to ask if you would please do a, basically chapter by chapter, not necessarily section by section, just summary of the model law so that um, everybody can have um, a reasonable starting point. And I know some people here are quite studied in it and I'm aware there will be some specific questions on the taxation and, and some of the other provisions, but I'd like to at least set kind of, um, a common framework of understanding. So with that, um, the floor is yours. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Um, Constance, um, Primavera, do you want me to start? Um, one other thing, uh, does I'm also part of Guala. Um, but um, I, I think of what is important to know. So uh, we have actually prepared yeah, yeah, a really you short- can the and then we do Q and A together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, I've, um, I, I, um, we have a short presentation, it's very basic just to um, set the stage. Um, I'm going to just share my screen um, if that works for you. Um, so I'm not very good with this. So just trying to find the right screen. One sec. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Actually, um, Constance, I'm actually <laughs> sorry. I cannot find it. One sec. 
you know, sometimes when you have the windows, the files, um, you should just open. Um, let me see what I'm sharing now. One sec. Uh, can you see the Koala model idea flow? Yes. PowerPoint. Um, yep, okay, perfect. Yes, it's, it's working. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, basically, so um, we have a few, very few, 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 few slides. Um, the general thing uh, about the theme and um, all of you already, I think um, you, some people already provided feedback, which was really great. So you you know a lot about that already. So, I mean, the, the whole premise of the model law is that it's um, based on the principles of um, regulatory and, and functional equivalence. Um, and it sets out the technological features that actually are regulatorily equivalent or even functionally equivalent to the corporate law rules, um, such that in uh, certain instances, you do not require those corporate law rules. I think this is one of the big principles of the model law. Um, so, and the, the idea is that if a state transposes this uh, model law that then, um, and the DAO, a DAO um, fulfills the requirements, they will get similar rights to um, uh, corporate entities, specifically um, limited liability uh, companies or similar entities. Um, and um, in chapter one, um, it's, very, it's a very important chapter, um, it deals with bestowing legal personality on the DAO, um, but only within the scope of the model law. So the definitions are very important for us. Um, there have been a lot of comments also received on definitions, and I, I assume or I expect that there might be uh, comments on this from you guys. Um, then uh, we have um, especially one definition that has been quite controversial and it took us quite a long time. So just for feed, uh, for back, um, background, um, this model law was, we started this project in 2018 uh, um, and the drafting uh, started end of uh, uh, beginning 2019. There's been a lot of discussions on how what a decentralized autonomous organization should be and whether it should be on a permissionless blockchain, a permission blockchain. So what I, what we did here is we put uh, the definition in case there is a, are comments on it. We very much like to have comments on this, but I would discourage uh, like a long discussion on just the definition because we don't want to get stuck on it because that's our experience. You know, we do a seminar over three days and then all we discuss about is like the definition of what a DAO is. Um, then in, in terms of chapter two, the chapter two deals um, uh, deals with, a, it's actually the heart of the, the whole model law. There's some of the very important uh, uh, articles, article four is on the person, uh, formation requirements. And as you can see here, what we did, we summarized them. I mean, it's much more in detail in the model law, but there are a few requirements that um, we thought um, are necessary to uh, get this functional equivalence and this regulatory equivalence um, established and the first one is the um, deployment of a permissionless blockchain, provision of a unique public address. I There I know there have been a lot of also discussions on that this is too close to Ethereum and uh, very much like to discuss um, about this. Um, the software code is, uh, is open source and or at least posted on a public forum. There should be an audit. Um, there should be at least a front end that uh, less technical people can and um, read. Um, there need to be comprehensive, understandable bylaws for the members to understand their rights. Um, there needs to be a point of contact of how to contact the DAO, and there need to be dispute resolution and mechanisms, um, and to make it the, the most, I mean, the, the core point about all of that is that no registration should be necessary. So you wouldn't need as in, in contrast to a lot of the other laws that are being, um, have been put forward. For example, Wyoming, we actually don't want, or we think it doesn't need to be required that the DAO, these unincorporated uh, DAOs, red, unregistered DAOs uh, register. Um, have I forgotten something? Yeah, then, then uh, chapter three um, deals, and obviously there, there are quite a lot of uh, clauses and we can't go through all of them, but uh, chapter three, the, the core of it is actually the limited liability um, and that um, members will not be held liable for the obligations of the DAO um, beyond their own contributions. 
um, in the most circumstances. Um, but that, you know, uh, to clarify that they stay um, liable in tort uh, for their own um, wrongful acts and omissions, um, but not for the wrongful um, acts of other members of the DAO. Um, the five, Article 5.3 has been very controversial. That's why I put it here. Uh, I would expect some comments uh, from you guys here about it. Um, Primavera or Constance, does any one of you continue or should I just go quickly through this? I think we're, we're almost, I think just running through the, the articles is fine. Um, but uh, I, I would just say just as a first cut, we, you know, when we were, when we were doing, uh, you know, maybe I'll, I'll save this commentary for after you're through the articles and then we can turn to the yeah. Q&A. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is just a very yeah. short summary. This is a short but, summary. Um, I mean, chapter four deals with a lot with um, ensuring like the different jurisdictions on this planet have uh, different least rigid uh, corporate laws for limited liability companies and similar entities. Um, what we wanted to clarify in chapter four is that, you know, um, uh, DAOs have as much uh, flexibility in how they internally organize as possible and actually specifying that in, the, um, in those articles. Um, one or two important things we thought are important to highlight perhaps here is that um, we do not think DAOs need to have administrators if they don't want to. So for administrators, we have defined it as board members, trustees, any of these uh, categories of people um, and suggested that when, because obviously a lot of DAOs now interact with off-chain assets or off-chain the meat space basically. So they might want to have legal represent, uh, representatives. Um, but what's important here is that it should be clear, it needs to be, you know, there's a, uh, the, the whole model of what there is a, like a, a red line that goes through it, which is basically, um, it's all about transparency and that, you know, the transparency has, uh, gives a regulatory equivalence um, to a lot of the, um, the protections corporate law seeks to provide, which is like principal agent problems, uh, minority shareholder issues. And um, so in that respect, you know, the legal representative should be, it should be clear who these people are and that they, um, um, what they what they are authorized to do for the DAO, but also they should not have um, legal liability, personal legal liability, in normal circumstances. Um, there's also, I mean, there have been a lot of uh, discussions on the fiduciary uh, duties and whether you know who in the DAO should have fiduciary duties. Um, it went so far that there are um, clauses in the terms of uh, a lot of blockchain projects that say there are no fiduciary duties. At uh, applying. Um, we also in this chapter in, in Article 4 suggested that holding a position with a particular title shouldn't lead to um, by itself su sufficient to imply fiduciary status. Um, chapter 5 um, deals with more of the um, DAO specific issues that you do not have with um, uh, legacy system corporate entities. Um, so um, there are a few like that we're dealing basically with hard forks in Article 6 and making it the default that the, the legal representation of the DAO should stay with the one on the majority chain unless um, the, uh, the DAO itself announces that this is not the case or that they want to do it differently. Um, Article 17 provides um, um, that if you know, I mean, obviously they're not just hard, hard forks, but um, migrations, um, upgrades, and modifications, and it um, seeks to ensure that you know a DAO doesn't start out um, under the model law and then changes, migrates, upgrades, and actually no longer fulfills it. So it makes clear that um, when these changes happen, that um, the requirements should continue to be fulfilled. Otherwise, they lose the benefits under the um, model law. Um, article 18 deals with a, and I have also gotten, um, there have been quite a few comments on articles 18 too. It deals with failure events or bugs, exploits, a lot of the technical issues that happen to DAOs. Um, and it suggests that 
to protect um, um, to the extent necessary to protect the DAO um, members and participants from personal liability, um, those benefits, the legal personality and limited liability should be maintained, um, but only to the extent. And then, and this is one of the most controversial clauses, in my opinion, um, in the model law, it deals with failure events on um, how these people are deploying or upgrading the DAO, whether they should be um, liable. And um, we suggested that the failure event may trigger liability only when they acted in manifest bad faith or gross negligence, which are very high standards uh, to attain. Um, chapter six um, deals with two, and I think article 80, uh, 20 is the, the article I'm most unhappy with yet, and that actually requires its own task force, which is basically a tax treatment um, of DAOs. And um, because this was a bit outside the scope, we, op we went for what we think right now is probably the most um, um, the, the most straightforward way to deal with them is basically to have DAOs as pass-through entities like LLCs, such as the members are responsible for tax compliance. Um, why? I mean, basically uh, DAOs are global and non-territorial and it, because they have no registration, um, it becomes very difficult to draw them into a certain uh, jurisdiction, and this is actually one of the biggest uh, risks uh, unincorporated DAOs currently face, uh, which is being drawn into the jurisdiction because any tax authority can just um, claim, like, claim that the DAO is in that jurisdiction. Um, Article 19 is uh, basically just suggesting that um, the national laws of a jurisdiction don't, um, you know, where if a jurisdiction decides to transpose or adapt the model law, they should really be, um, they should only be filled, only the lacuna, only the holes or, or where things are missing, those should be filled by the, um, the national business laws. And um, yeah, here I wrote the article again, and that's it. Um, and I think um, Primavera and Constance, please add here, um, whatever I have missed. Uh, no, no, that's a, that's a great summary. I, I just wanted to provide a little bit of uh, context for how this came about and why we focused on this project. You know, Koala has been looking at um, uh, this stuff for a long time. Um, and one of the, the concepts that came up, you know, many years ago actually for us was this concept of illegality because so many of these crypto projects and technologies are not visible to the law. Um, they're, not, uh, they're not encompassed by the law because the law has not contemplated these kinds of structures, objects, um, technologies, and rails. Um, but they, and they are neither illegal, they are not considered contrary to the law because the law simply hasn't looked at it. They're, they're illegal. They, the, law, the law as it stands, um, that these DAOs are just not visible to the law. And, and what is visible about these DAOs activity to the law are things, uh, they, they look like uh, organizations, they look like they might be akin to corporations, they might, um, so, so uh, lawmakers, policymakers, and participants in the space are, are left to try to analogize things that really can't be analogized. So, so what Koala really did was we, we, uh, we, we looked at all of the, the, the public policy objectives and the mechanisms that are used uh, for these, for organizations, organizational rules. And we tried to do a mapping exercise where we uh, figured out, you know, what about these DAOs are, are in, in the way they work, are structure, are, are functionally equivalent to the way, you know, traditional corporate, uh, or, you know, corporations or business organizations are structured and regulated. So what, what uh, 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 rules and mechanisms can we, create a functional equivalence to in the DAO space. And then for those that don't have any functional equivalence, where can we say, um, while uh, we can't achieve that policy goal in the same way, we can achieve that goal in a different way. So a lot of these, uh, we try to transpose basically the underpinnings for why these rules exist, um, i.e. solving uh, these kinds of, uh, you know, principal agent, um, you know, participants and member problems and translate that to the way DAOs work. Um, so uh, 
at the same time, acknowledging that DAOs are ever evolving, that uh, we didn't want to be prescriptive about, about the ways and, and the varieties and structures that DAOs might form in the future. So we tried to leave as much flexibility while meeting um, uh, the, 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 the underpinnings of, of you know, why we want to regulate these things, why we're really concerned. So um, that's just a little bit of context for uh, how, how we went, went about uh, translating and creating, drafting this framework. Uh, anything else from the presenters before we dig into the discussion? Uh, Primavera, others? Um, yeah, no, I think, I think that's, uh, that's an overview. Um, maybe like what we're looking for. Um, so right now we have uh, we have published this first draft. Uh, the idea with this draft was really to uh, create and initiate discussions, um, but with uh, that with data um, policymakers and so forth. Uh, and it's already envisioned that uh, there will be a second version. So actually, as we go through this uh, exercise today. I actually would love if you can give us like as much uh, constructive feedback, including criticism as possible. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> because this is actually, we're gonna collect all this stuff and we're gonna use it in order to create a new review. You is interested in the effort, uh, joining the task force, uh, being part of the revision process or helping out with specific sections, please. Uh, also, let us know, and uh, it is intended to be a collaborative endeavor. Outstanding. So, on that last point, um, Primavera or others, yes, um, people in this group, or the many more people that will see the YouTube video after today, want to take you up on your kind offer. Yeah, to here's why. It's a 2020 um, loan. Whoever's on, Jeffrey, get on mute. We're just getting the guarantees for, and once yeah. it's all in place, we do an amendment. To <laughs> All right, sorry about that. We're doing business and speaking of doing business, what what would they do? Like what what URL would they go to or email would they send or who would they tweet if they wanted to get involved and contribute? I think the the, the easiest way would be to use the Koala one. Um, should we put them in, maybe we can put them in the chat um, here, um, that'd be useful. Yep. Um, generally, I think you can always get in touch with any uh, any of the three of us and any of the other co-authors. There are a few other people who have put a lot of time into this. Um, but yeah, um, this would probably be easiest via Twitter, email. Um, that would be my suggestion. And of course, um, you can reach most of us also via Telegram under the same handles. Um, yeah, let me... Um, let me put them here and maybe right. Constance, you you have them handy because the, the koala one, I'm interested. So while you're doing that, um, I want to ask um, those who are present, and I know some of you have some specific feedback, just like um, raise your hand or put something in chat so I can make sure we get to everybody. And I'll kick us off with a clarification and a question. Um, the clarification is, uh, you'd mentioned, Silke, that um, a really important feature of this model law is that it doesn't require registration, like in the way that you would have to um, go to a Secretary of State in Massachusetts yeah. to incorporate a C Corp or, uh, or to form mm -hmm. an LLC. Um, and that really is critical. Um, and, uh, and in the spirit of, of uh, these sort of bottom up uh, decentralized formations, not having a, you know, especially a governmental control point. But you also mentioned, uh, by way of clarification, that um, that would be unlike um, that you characterize as a requirement for registration for DAOs with the Wyoming statute. And so we've been fortunate to have uh, Wyoming um, uh, people here in the past. And so just so uh, people are aware, there's no requirement in Wyoming that DAOs register. It's completely optional. So if there's a DAO that wanted to have the form of a Wyoming LLC, then they can do that. And then there's actually, because this has been confusing to others, I'll just do a public service announcement, which is there's amendments coming, to even make clear that if you're a DAO and an LLC in Wyoming, you don't even have to select the DAO LLC option. You can just never tell the government that you're a regular Wyoming LLC 
and a DAO. Um, and so this has been a question in the past, but uh, it this does stand for a policy based um, sensibility that DAOs are really, I think we people wish to regard them more as bottom up voluntary organizations that are not, uh, that don't have central governmental permission based, um, you know, ex existence um, choke points. And uh, that's terribly important. By way of a question now, uh, I, say, I see that fiduciary duties are not required um, of, of members. And so my question is, how do you feel this model, at least this version of the model law, um, addresses the, the need to avoid an accountability gap? Um, so w w for those states, uh, like, well, like Wyoming, uh, to have an LLC, um, there needs to be some members or the, or the managing, uh, uh, the manager that does have fiduciary duties and that sort of helps support, um, certain protections and judgment and also some recourse, uh, mm -hmm. for decisions that are made. Um, and so that's sort of how they address it. How, how would those kinds of protections and um, recourse or just assurance of good judgment be addressed in this form of an entity? Um, one sec. Primavera, Constance, do you want to address that? Or like, first, I mean, uh, as, a, as a summary, um, the current one says that uh, it doesn't exclude actually the possibility of there being fiduciary duties attaching um, to persons that are um, active in the DAO. Um, right now, how it is done, um, and let me just go back to the presentation, is that um, it suggests, and um, if you want to go to the fiduciary duties, one moment. Um, And maybe I, I haven't fully written it in the presentation, but let me just uh, pull it up um, in the actual um, PDF copy we just shared. Basically what it does is it um, just doesn't say, just because of the roles a certain person have doesn't mean that automatically they have, uh, should have certain uh, fiduciary duties. That doesn't mean that if, a, if, for example, if you have a, um, let's say you have a whale uh, in a DAO um, and the person holds themselves, first of all, holds themselves out as a fiduciary or does unconscionable conduct and therefore should be ex post um, assigned fiduciary duties. That is not the, the ex this uh, assignment or the holding by a court that someone had fiduciary duties. Um, isn't excluded basically that it isn't. It, the, the model law doesn't exclude this possibility, and that's very much what um, states with the national um, uh, jurisdiction on it. But I think what's really what people are really worried about in the current um, DAO space is that people attach fiduciary duties to um, just because someone has a certain title or someone some you know developed um, the code uh, for the DAO. I mean, there has been you know, many years we have discussed about whether uh, developers that uh, publish code should have fiduciary duties, um, you know, including like, um, like obligations of maintenance. So at this moment in time, there isn't any further uh, discussion on it, um, but it would be good to know whether you think there should be additional one, because I do see the point that there is some fragmentation, like it has pot potential of a lot of fragmentation, because what you do is like the jurisdiction might then expose, say that is a person that had fight, you should have had fiduciary duties and the other person, um, you know, um, and in a different jurisdiction, they come to a different conclusion. But um, what I wanted to make clear is that there aren't right now, um, it doesn't say that there are no fiduciary duties, it just makes sure that they're not outright assigned to different people, especially because this model uh, allows, you know, some, it, it's very flat and, and there's a lot of um, um, op 
for potential by DAOs to organize themselves, especially in chapter four. So you have like, you can have proxies, you can have delegation. It's all, you can have different rights of um, members. But let me, I'm, I'm trying to do two things at the same time. It's not working very well because my computers, um, my internet connection is very bad. So I'm not even able to scroll down. But I think um, that is article 15. Um, and I'm going to post it in the chat. So just for you to see. I, said, I think I saw Constance come off mute. I'm not sure if that signals that you'd, you'd like. To yeah, continue. she was. Yeah, I was just going to add, um, you know, nothing in this model law precludes any, um, you know, uh, uh, responsibility for breach of fiduciary duties fraud, you know, unconscionable conduct, all of these things are, are, you know, clearly, you know, out, out, not contemplated as appropriate behavior in this, in this framework. What we were trying to militate against is this, um, the current state of affairs, which is right now, DAOs as seen through the legal system, um, uh, an unreformed legal system, DAOs appear to be, uh, you know, people working, at, at, at traditional corporate rules might, might um, leave, you know, a developer liable, uh, you know, for the actions of, you know, a, a fork, uh, you know, that happened years later with that same code. So, you know, we're, we're dealing with flat organizations that are transnational in nature. We want to keep that, that global nature um, and permissionless uh, membership uh, so that people from all over the world can, can participate. So, um, so what we've done is we, you know, the way the model law is, it's quite distinct from other efforts in that it does not require registration, but how we try to achieve the goals that things like registration or um, you know, express fiduciaries for certain roles. What we're trying to do is, is, is to reach the, the, the policy goal of those rules in a different way. So um, you know, making sure that the DAO is, is um, able to be contacted by lay people, um, uh, ensuring that uh, if, if the DAO elects to um, send a representative to go into you know, the meet space, the RL and, write, and, and sign a, a contract on behalf of the DAO, that that person is, is not um, imbued with fiduciaries that other members of the DAO are not um, just by virtue of not being picked to be the one. So, so this is, these are the kinds of, you know, uh, kind of complicated compromises and, and equivalences that we need to, to deal with. And, and, for, and on our part, we wanted, given the state of affairs now, to allow a lot of flexibility in that internal organization but delineate in the framework that you know if you do if you do commit fraud if you do act in bad faith um, you're you're not you're you're not safe this law won't help you this model law won't help you so um, and then also we've put in several provisions that have to do with you know um, notice procedural fairness making sure that everybody uh, has uh, has an ability to participate substantively in this in this process. Um, so it's a bit of a caveat, caveat emptor, and we put in some thought into how DAOs might in the future come up with insurance, uh, common pooled in insurance schemes to cover certain things. But um, but we really felt that um, you know not requiring the registration requirement, but ensuring that the DAO can be reached. Um, and that that you know members are supposed to act in good faith. That 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 might um, uh, be be the path forward for now. And and obviously you know there's a lot of work to be done. You know as the space develops. Thank it would you be so really much. nice to know. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, yeah. I, I would just just to put a pin in this one. Um, uh, thank you for your responses to that uh, feedback uh, or to that question rather. And then I have a bit of feedback and then we have uh, two or three people with their hands raised. So this is, <laughs> this is not deeply considered feedback, I should say, but I have a, I think it's, I have high enough confidence that there's something in it. So I want to at least share it with you. So I have a feeling that, so on the one hand, that the, the idea that this is not a, you know, get out of jail free for, you know, unconscionable behavior or fraud uh, is well taken, but that doesn't quite get at what I was putting out there with fiduciary duties with decision makers or people with particular power in the process, because those are higher duties of loyalty and duties of care uh, that are appropriate sometimes. I do think that those are appropriate sometimes when 
when there's maybe a lot of uh, people's assets or rights at stake and where some people have greater decision making. Um, and that's precisely why maybe later a court might impute those uh, to people. And so my feedback is, I think it would be interesting to try in the next version um, to see if there's a way uh, by way of the caveat emptor to, to make a simple signaling in the DAO, um, you know, equivalent of bylaws or organizing instruments where there's a DAO that does have fiduciary duties or the equivalent uh, for some members uh, so that people can quickly see, oh, if I'm going to put this much money or other value or rely so much on a DAO, there are people that, you know, that are up to the task and who are going to look after my interests uh, at a higher level, not simply not have gross negligence or try to like defraud me. Like that's not that level, but a higher level of a fiduciary. So people could quickly select for themselves whether they want to take that risk or not w without requiring every DAO, you know, to provide such a thing. So that's my, my kind of general feedback is I think there is something helpful with fiduciary duties in certain circumstances. And it would be nice if almost at a glance, people could distinguish if a DAO did provide that and, and if that was what they wanted to select in a caveat emptor world. Yeah, so actually, like, can I just say about the caveat emptor um, that goes through the whole model law is basically um, the idea that a lot the at least at the moment and um, everything is very transparent and it should be you know um, made transparent whether they are minority rights for example or like also maybe and maybe that we should make this a bit clearer like that um, whether there are fiduciaries for the DAO. Um, that have certain obligations or not. Um, so we have actually defined in the model law that, you know, public signaling, like this is a public forum, like these uh, the matters, you know, to get to the formation status, you have to provide all these details in public so that people can decide whether they actually want to deal with this DAO or not. Um, but that's a good point um, that maybe we should add that there. Brendan wants to say something. Oh, uh, so I had on my list, uh, Brian. Uh, oh, sorry, I just I uh, looked at the thingy. So well, whoever um, you are um, good, you does or do you do that? So so, uh, we, so what I have is uh, Brendan, then uh, or her honor, uh, Judge Renita, and then Wasim, and then I think by order of hands that I'm saying Brendan and then Dennis. So uh, Brian, you've got the floor. Yeah. So. One of the things that I've been really interested in lately is, uh, you know, this definition of autonomous. Uh, and I think it has become particularly interesting, for example, in the context of something like Fort, Fort Dow, which was essentially a multi-sig with, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was kind of autonomous in that it was, uh, it, it was kind of a Dow in the sense that it is, you know, distributed, obviously it's an organization, but the autonomous part of it, um, because of the way that it uses the multi-sig, it's not really functionally autonomous. Um, one of the main developers was able to just say, hey, I don't want to do this. And, you know, it, it caused it to, you know, essentially enter this death spiral. Um, and so, you know, I, I was drilling down into the definition of, uh, of a DAO in this. And I was curious if they're like, what, what do y'all make about the relationship between on-chain governance and off-chain governance um, through something like Snapshot or, uh, you know, these other applications like Sna Snapshot combined with multi-sig, um, you know, do you, like, how do you see that playing out? And, you know, would it, I, I know some of these things are kind of developing while this is developing. And so um, I'm curious about thoughts around autonomous um, mainly. Is, is it, uh, maybe, maybe so, this is a better so, question to form maybe, is it, is it worth distinguishing between um, fully autonomous uh, on-chain governance and, you know, off-chain uh, partially off-chain, partially on-chain, um, et cetera. Uh, just as a first cut, I will say that, um, uh, and this might be a controversial statement, there is no DAO that is purely on-chain governance. 
and never will be. Um, so you will always have to deal with um, uh, how to uh, how to deal with kind of these soft governance issues that will come up regardless of what is executed on chain. I think people see that execution function as the governance, but a lot of governance is actually what happens before before that execution um, or after. So um, you know, in that in that sense, I don't think we we are we created this framework for for like an autonomous agent outside of of, of people. Um, now, uh, it, we did spend a lot of time on that definition of DAOs. You know, it's kind of for those of us who were here in, in the early days, you know, it was kind of like the same question around, you know, Bitcoin or crypto. You know, you could ask 10 people what it is and you get 10 different definitions and it's the same for DAOs. Um, what we really did here was to distinguish between permissioned and permissionless DAOs because the same kinds of, of policy concerns um, around, you know, identifying members or enabling this kind of permissionless co contribution and, and, and participation. The, these issues are, are disparate for permissioned and permissionless blockchains. So this framework is, is created for permissionless blockchains because it addresses those unique issues. Okay, a, a matter of, uh, of uh, housekeeping, uh, the, the new order is uh, after Brian, it's going to be Renita, Wasim, Dell, Brendan, and then Dennis. And I see that Primavera, you have your hand up. And I just want to say as our honored, cherished guest, you can talk anytime you want. So it's just like my connection is not so good. So I hope it's not going to drop. Um, I think so. I think it's an, it's an interesting question because the scope of the DAO model law is actually uh, perhaps one of the most tricky questions. And uh, we clearly uh, we clearly wanted to eliminate from the scope of the of the model law uh, things that are just smart contracts, meaning that those are things that are do not require any human intervention uh, in terms of on-chain governance, uh, because at this point then you're just you're just a box, you're just a machine that is just operating. So the autonomy is uh, uh, like the word autonomy is extremely confusing anyhow, but uh, if you say autonomy in order to say something that does not require any human intervention, this is actually outside of the scope. And, uh, and we, we use this kind of wording to uh, kind of avoid the whole discussion, which is the notion of having something that whose governance is technically decentralized. Uh, even though, of course, we cannot, uh, we cannot commit to making sure that it's always operationally decentralized. Um, and that means that, of course, there can be a lot of things at the operational level, uh, which happens off chain, which might lead to very strong centralization in the governance structure. But as long as the, uh, the technical implementation. Uh, you dropped. Um, well, uh, I dropped. This, this, is, um, um, this is something to be judged by by whoever is is and needs to assess whether this DAO qualify within the the provision of the of the model law. But for instance, if you have something that uh, uh, is just like there is one owner that controls the whole DAO, that's not technically decentralized. If you have something that relies on a multiplicity of like governance tokens, it is technically decentralized. Even though, of course, there is this possibility that one single actor owns all the tokens in which case it will be operationally highly centralized, but from like a technical perspective, it will still qualify as a DAO. Uh, and then of course you have this complex question when you have a multi-sig, well, how many people are part of the multi-sig and is this multi-sig to be, is considered to be sufficiently decentralized to actually qualify? And we decided not to incorporate this answer. There is no, there is no objective answer that you can give, but a judge can assess whether technically speaking, uh, the design and the implementation of the of the smart contract that is governing DAO was done in a way that at least the technical intention was decentralization. I also uh, think that um, I also, if I may add, I also think that um, with more and more modules, I mean, at the moment we are in this phase where we see a lot of um, DAOs that try to have like some kind of a lean, slim 
um, way of governance or like they, they set up quickly what they do is they use a nose safe and, and added the snapshot to it um, and you know um, right now so that is very much like we just had this discussion actually very much going back from what we previously had like very very cool DAO stack frameworks that were a little bit too complicated so we are the opposite spectrum of that at this moment in time however there's so many projects right now that actually are building modules um, to to, um, you know, get the off-chain voting um, into the DAOs. So uh, I, I think that there's probably quite, it's a temporary, there's a temporary issue, um, which I'm also, a lot of people ask what is actually autonomous and is this even a DAO? Um, because obviously what I see at the moment is a lot of companies just call themselves DAO. I mean, they have an LLC somewhere and then, you know, it's like, Previously, it was XYZ LLC in Puerto Rico. Now it's like XYZ DAO and nothing has really changed. So, I mean, these are all, I would say, Dinos, DAO in the name only. It's just because you ride away. Um, but I wouldn't fully, I would don't think that, that one should exclude the multi-sig plus snapshot from the definition um, here, but that's my personal opinion. And But right now it doesn't seem to be um, the case that it is excluded, but also um, the definition of what is actually the DAO, is it just a multi-sig or um, is it a multi-sig plus snapshot? So it's actually the token holders. I would uh, suggest that it's still, even under the model law, not just the um, multi-sig um, holders, if there's a governance token and the, the governance is done off chain. So I would just not attach so much importance to the A in the, in, in the current discussion we have. And I do not think it is um, it's relevant, or you could even take that out uh, of the model law. It still hold the definition as it is right now. But and, and I think also, oh, I was just going to add one comment that that I think uh, Brian, you, you did hit a, a very um, I think intuitive problem, which is you have on one hand uh, you know on chain activities, and then you have you know, the meat space world. And then, yeah. you know, and for these legal structures, you have another parallel reality, which is a legal fiction, right? A legal vehicle that exists in, in, in for, 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 the, for the legal space. So um, how we sync up all of these realities um, and, and, and how we interact on chain and off chain um, in, a, in a coherent way um, that still has yet to be developed. And as Silky mentioned, you know, DAO tooling and, and these modules are being developed right now. And it, it, it is something that needs to be addressed. Awesome. Thank you all so much for your answers. And I, I'm going to respond with some feedback to the email info at Kalala um, because I've been down a rabbit hole here. Thanks. Our pleasure. Thank you. So I see that um, this has been so fun uh, that we're almost out of time already, which is terrible. This should have been three hours of feedback, um, but we're trying to do this sort of in the format of our general um, idea flow. Uh, session. Uh, and so I, what I'd like to ask, uh, just so we can get it on the table, is for everybody that's in line to just speak your question or comment or feedback one after the other, so that they can all be heard. Um, and then um, that will at least fulfill our, <laughs> our, our obligation to, uh, to, to, to uh, provide it. So first up in our new order is going to be Dennis with uh, on tax. So Dennis, uh, and if you could go crisply so we can hear from everyone before we time out, please. Yeah, yeah, and thank you. Dada. So, so just real quick, I have a couple of comments on on the tech side. Uh, obviously, I'm doing some research on DAOs uh, from the University of Amsterdam. Uh, I will share those comments by email as well. But I, I think the concept, as as um, laid forward now, for me raises a lot of questions from a tech side. In terms, I, I know it's focusing on income tax, but obviously there are lots of other taxes that may come into play. And I I, I wonder whether this actually this framework actually. Uh, well, for me, it raises a lot of additional questions in terms of how do you deal with, you know, withholding taxes, indirect taxes, tax reporting issues, tax residency, uh, 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 the fact that nobody is tax liable uh, is, is a no-go, obviously. So I'm, I'm happy to respond in more detail and also to contribute. So I will share that uh, via email, but just uh, wanted to raise that. Thank you. Um, about, can I just say about the tax, I really love comments on tax um, because this is one of the provisions that's going to make a DAO, unregistered DAO fail or succeed. Like this needs to be resolved. The current definition is not sufficient. So there is right. going to be, if anyone wants to be in a tax force to work on this, please let me know. 
Yeah, we might, by the way, um, do so I talked over some of this with uh, my colleagues at Ernst and Young um, and uh, and we may do a future idea flow exactly on tax and, and these entities and some related things. So um, stand by for that. Uh, next up, we have her honor, Judge Renita. Daza, uh, I am. I'm not that Renita. That one is. Oh, sorry. I did. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, so we have uh, Renita. Plain Renita. <laughs> yes. Yes. Judge Renita. I don't see her in the participants. So I'm sorry. Uh, okay. So thank you, Daza, and thank you to the presenters. I have a couple of questions about the compliance issue. You mentioned that there can be. Um, organizations that start off with the modern law and then drift off doing something else. In that case, how do we ensure that continued compliance with the modern law is enforced? Um, and the second one was related to anonymity. Is there a preferred or required level of non-anonymity that's required of the members? And I'm asking because of your slides and at various points you mentioned the human element and do DAOs have something in place to say that they need to be doxxed to a certain level and so these were just general questions I had thank you love it thank you so much and it notice the formation need to be doxxed so there's already kind of like a, a strong pro DAO point of view next we have Wasim uh, Wasim you're up yeah, I'll just try to be really, uh, really quick. Um, and so we've been doing a series of uh, workshops uh, here at Trust in Berlin around a, a kind of a very well known and old crypto art project. And uh, we had a session on DAOs last weekend, and we came up with the replacement A for autonomous. And I will reveal that in my next column. Um, but yeah, I think there's uh, something also interesting to say about this gap between on and off chain. Because we're talking about as the tooling gets developed, this gap between what we think of as off-chain governance and on-chain, fully on-chain, fully off-chain, there's going to be shades of grey in there. So I suppose the the framework would probably have to either account for that, or um, in, in explicitly, or find some kind of way of dealing with uh, with tolerance. And I like this idea of uh, distinguishing at uh, the low end of what a DAO is between like, is it multi-sig, is it multi-sig plus snap, snapshot, does it have to have on-chain voting? And maybe then there's a useful concept of like a minimum viable DAO that can come out of uh, something like that. And I will yield. Yeah, thank you for the great talk. I'm on mute. Yeah, I'm great at Zoom. Uh, and next up we have Dell. Uh, speaking of taxes, um, you're up. Thank you. And my, my question is fairly simple and I think I have a great example. Um, I'm actually a member of LinksDAO, which is a DAO that was created to buy a golf course somewhere, right? And the, the question is, from a tax perspective, LinksDAO, let's say they have an event and they sell LinksDAO golf shirts and they make $50,000. Who exactly has to pay income tax on that $50,000 of income? And that's really the question, right? And, and I think... You know, that, that's, I think that's a very hard question for DAOs, particularly DAOs that don't know who their holders are. And are they the people who own the governance token or the other token, if they have some other token, that, the participation token? And, and I think those kinds of issues are uh, really, really important. So that's my question and I will. Thank you, Del. Um, so much on, on tax. And finally, uh, we have uh, Media Lab's own Brendan. Brendan Marr, you're up. Oh, great. Can everybody hear me? I, I think you got um, um, great, great, to, great to see you all. Um, the, the points that I have that I think are important to provide clarity on are definitely along the lines of what Brian was talking about in terms of on-chain and, and off-chain uh, representations. Uh, because you're going to have uh, lots of other things that are not going to be on chain, such as you know documents, etc. Things that are going to be on external um, decentralized storage, such as IPFS, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the, you know the general lawyers that are out there that are going to be reviewing all these things are, are you know are, are going to need to resolve you know exactly you know what is is on chain and and what is off chain. But to that note, and this is actually extraordinarily important, and it's I think. And I believe you have the means of making some clarity here based on what you already have. And what I'm 
discussing and the point about is this idea of open source software. You have in Article 14, the notion of a legal representative being cryptographically uh, verifiable. And that's great language. Uh, and, and as you know, I'm also involved in the Wyoming Digital Identity Working Group. And this idea of cryptographically verifiable is extremely important when it comes to the idea of how these things are expressed as we've been talking about multi-sigs, et cetera, et cetera, because not everything is going to have a representation as a smart contract and in open source form. This is really important because we have this notion of, of smart contracts and open source, which is in very much pervasive in the Ethereum community, but there'll be lots of computational logic, which is not going to be open source, which is gonna be a very small binary compatible representation, but a representation which can be cryptographically verifiable. So, and, and we see this now with lots of things. AI does not work with, with, uh, with, with code. You know, the logic in AI is, is models. So that will need to be resolved. I can go on, but I won't. Thank you. I'm so sorry that we're out of time. Uh, last thing from people in the Wyoming DAO and Identity Task Force was there was some concern about uh, a sense that this may be very technology specific in practice to Ethereum. Um, and I think you didn't necessarily intend that. And I'll just further say, I think there's no law against having a technology specific law, um, but it the question is how specific do you want to be and it gets back down that rabbit hole of public you know permissionless and and where you want to draw those lines but um so with that i hope that some of this feedback was helpful to you uh, thank you so much for reaching out for feedback and we want to wish you well as you redraft the dow model law in the future and uh and that's that great this episode of idea flow thank you very much thank you so much and Please join our task force to improve this.